Good evening, everyone. Uh, this is Governor John Carney. I'm here for our virtual town hall meeting tonight with uh, Secretary of the uh, Department of Health and Social Services, Dr. Kara Odom Walker. It's been a busy, busy weekend and a, a busy day for all of us. We're here for this uh, virtual town hall meeting to talk to you, provide information to all of you who've decided to tune in, and we thank you for that about our attempts to curtail the spread of the coronavirus uh, here in the state of Delaware. To give you some updates uh, as the situation evolves here in our state, to let you know where you could get help, and in particular to answer questions that you have. And we've taken a whole list of questions, and they're great questions, and we'll try to spend most of our time tonight uh, answering those questions uh, so that you can figure out how to to operate on a day-to-day -day basis. Uh, first and foremost, uh, we have information from the DPH call center down in Smyrna. I visited them today. We've got a great team answering calls and, and pro providing the information that you need. That hotline number is 1-866-408-1899, 1-866-408-1899. It's a 24-hour uh, number at a call center, and we've got lots of good people uh, ready to answer any questions that you have. We also have a website operating, de.gov slash coronavirus, de.gov slash coronavirus. Uh, the situation in Delaware now, when we last were together uh, last Wednesday, we just had the first uh, three or four cases confirmed uh, presumed positive, that is, and the, they've been confirmed since then. Now we're up to eight. Uh, six of those are all related to the one group of folks uh, from the University of Delaware that traveled to New Jersey, and where our, our folks uh, in public health are tracing down the contacts uh, that the other two made. And so we're making progress on that. There are a lot, there's a lot of information and questions to go over, as you probably know. Uh, I directed that the schools across our state uh, be closed for two weeks, mostly uh, to so that we could plan for how do we feed uh, children when they're not in school, uh, how do we uh, move our seniors along and prepare them for graduation, how do we educate our children remotely uh, during a period of time, thinking about uh, this could be longer than, than two weeks, and so we have a working group uh, that's been established, uh, Dr. Uh, Susan Bunting and uh, John Chi and my policy uh, advisor for education is working with that group with Mike Jackson and we have some questions related uh, that we've taken that related to education in our schools and in all of these instances you'll find that part of our answer is it's, a, it's an evolving situation and we're making decisions as information uh, comes at us. Uh, I was on a phone call with President uh, Trump and Vice President Pence and their team and all the governors across our country talking about the situation in the individual states and answering questions. And one of the things that was said by the he head of the CDC is we're always kind of two days behind uh, what's actually happening on the ground because we don't have test results for 24 to 48 hours. And so uh, the situation can be better or worse, probably at this juncture, worse than, than we know it is today. And that's why we've taken more dramatic actions. I've, I've revised uh, my uh, state of emergency declaration uh, to limit now Delaware, Delaware restaurants, the bars and taverns to take out service only uh, and drive through and delivery services only, again, to help prevent uh, the spread of uh, the coronavirus in our state. We've also banning public gatherings of 50 people or more for the next eight weeks, consistent with the updated CDC guidelines. It turns out later in the day after we made this, uh, this declaration, the CDC changed its guidelines uh, and limited those gatherings to 10 people or more. So we'll be ratcheting that down uh, tomorrow as well. And so that gives you an idea of how fluid the situation is and how we're responding as the information changes. We've also closed gaming activities at the Delaware casinos consistent with what's happening in New Jersey uh, and surrounding states. We've also authorized the uh, Secretary of Labor to develop emergency rules for to protect Delaware workers 
uh, with their unemployment benefits, and we have a question that relates to that. So we're trying to be prepared for workers uh, being laid off or, or not, not uh, being paid uh, so that they can pay their mortgage and their rent or whatever the case may be. Uh, obviously, as I said at the top, this is an evolving situation. Uh, our expectation is that it's going to get worse before it gets better. We're going to have more cases. It's likely that we'll have what's referred to as community spread, which are cases uh, for whom we don't find an individual uh, source uh, of that, uh, unlike the University of Delaware group that's been the main focus of our positive cases uh, so far. So next, we're going to deal with your questions. Uh, first of all, I, I want to thank Dr. Walker and her team, Dr. Rite, and all the workers at the Division of Public Health. As we speak, they're down at our State Health Operations Center in Smyrna, uh, and there are scores of them, uh, making sure trace, tracking down leads on contacts that were made by, by individuals who've uh, tested positive, by planning for uh, a revised testing re regime that we're working with the hospitals and, and private labs on, and just doing an incredible amount of work on behalf of the people of our state. I want to thank all of them for putting in lo long days and nights and over the weekend, and, and they're going to be doing that for, for some time to come. Dr. Walker, if there's something you'd like to say, we'll get right into the questions, if not. Absolutely. Thank you, Governor. I also want to thank the team and thank many of you who have reached out with really creative ideas and great questions that are making us think through not only the current situation, but also how we plan for the next coming weeks and months. And I think that's the important part that we're early in this process of, of really understanding where we are in, in the coronavirus spread in our state. And we really need to continue to have everyone stay informed and up to date on the current numbers. So uh, continue to reach out to us. Definitely let us know if you have questions or concerns about exposure and risks and ideas about how to come together and support our community at this time is in critical importance. And the decision that I'm making with our team uh, up here on all these matters really uh, takes the information, uh, the science-based information we get from uh, Dr. Walker and Dr. Rite and their teams uh, to, to determine what we should do about closing and, and limiting uh, social contact and, and all of the rest. And a lot of the uh, questions uh, tonight that we're going to deal with are really practical questions about the operations of state government. And the first question I'm going to start with, which is one uh, about whether we're going to close the DMV facilities. Obviously, people need to get their cars registered and their new licenses and all the rest of it. But uh, what I want to say before answering this specific question, I'm going to basically read directly from the press release put out by uh, Secretary Cohen and her team and the the, the folks over there at DMV is that we've got our cabinet group working on conference calls and meetings uh, several times a day on a daily basis, kind of figuring out how to protect our state employees, how to keep state government open, open and how to limit uh, that personal contact, if you will. That'll be the driver so that we can do uh, state government business remotely, if you will, online, and you'll see some of the answers to these, these questions. And so this question is from Lisa, uh, and it is that question, do we have any plans to close the DMV? And the answer is no, uh, that we're planning on operating to the extent we can remotely. Uh, all of Del Dot's DMV, four DMV locations uh, will be accepting only credit or debit cards accepted, and so we're not going to be exchanging money. Uh, the department continues to urge all customers to continue to use mydmv.delaware.gov. That's mydmv.delaware.gov, uh, which offers more than 20 services online. So if you have a need to get services from the Division of Motor Vehicles, use their online service at mydmv.delaware.gov. It also includes renewal of your D Delaware driver's license, renewing vehicle registration, changing your home address. Um, so we're, we are um, canceled any further, until further notice, vision tests will be temporarily waived, and DMV is also suspending emissions testing for vehicles. The DMV lobbies, you know, because we have this uh, this restriction on number of people in one place, 
will continue to be monitored with the goal of keeping them below whatever that target, 50 moving to, to 10. So that'll be a, a challenging uh, thing for all of us. And then at the three toll plazas, there will be no toll collectors working to collect cash payments. Everything will be routed through uh, the easy pass lane and motorists that don't have an easy pass will get billed later. So these are important practical uh, things that we're doing and you'll see this throughout each agency changing the public facing service that we provide so that there's little of, uh, of that uh, personal touch that happens so uh, the virus can't be tr tr transmitted from one individual to another. So the first question that I have is actually pertaining to how the virus is transmitted. And I think it is really important, and many of you may have seen this in the media, but it's important to remember that the virus is a respiratory uh, virus. It is transmitted through a cough that is, and then the virus is actually carried on respiratory droplets. So when you cough, uh, some of the, the saliva from your mouth or from your mucus from your nose is carrying the virus forward. And sometimes a sneeze or a cough can actually project those droplets up to six feet. And that's why the idea of social distancing is very important. So you can stay away from those droplets. Um, it's also important to remember that if you're coughing or sneezing, that you're doing so and into an area that's not your hand and not touching your face, but into a, a sleeve and then um, washing your hands as well if you're wiping your nose or covering a cough. We, we are trying to make sure that we're limiting the person-to-person -person contact because that is how the virus is transmitted. And uh, for those of you who worry about whether you've been exposed, it really does take a, a couple of days before the virus starts shedding um, and symptoms are present. So the symptoms are really important because the symptoms are, are also what um, makes the, the virus kind of replicate. There's more of it around, and so it's easier to transmit it through these uh, coughs or sneezes or, or other things that may happen. And so, um, again, think about social distancing for those of you who are in high-risk categories over the age of 60 or have chronic medical conditions or have uh, suppressed immune systems. Definitely think about staying home at this time because no amount of social distancing can really protect you 100%. And so social distancing and avoiding that personal contact is kind of the key, you know, in keeping appropriate uh, sanitation practices to just to prevent that spread. And that's why you'll, you'll hear, and that's why we've changed uh, the, the rules, if you will, the rules of engagement on the number of people in individual gatherings. So you don't expect, and that you have that six, uh, six foot cushion. Exactly. You notice we have a six foot cushion here uh, between the, the two of us. So I have a, a, a number of kind of practical questions. Uh, the first one is, am I, are we placing restrictions on people returning from traveling outside the country? We are not doing that. That's uh, been done at the federal level. But it, we are uh, advising people that have traveled from some of the uh, levels of uh, some areas around the world, Italy, South Korea, uh, some of China, some of these other places, that. Uh, if they have flu-like symptoms that they get themselves tested. But we are not placing restrictions on travel at this time. It's, uh, that's happening at the federal and national level. That's right. And we have had questions about whether I've traveled to other states or cities who are experiencing a greater levels of the virus. And obviously, you want to pay attention to where you've gone. If there is community spread, watch your symptoms, maybe consider staying at home after returning from a cruise or from a visit to um, some places in the West Coast. Uh, the question I have is, how is coronavirus different risk-wise from having a bad flu? Uh, so what we're seeing, and we're still learning every day about the true risks of coronavirus, but we believe it's about 10 times um, more deadly than the flu. And it actually is even more deadly for those who are in the older age categories. Those over age 70 and 80 are really having a hard time with this uh, virus. And those are the individuals that we want to try really hard to keep out of the hospital, out of the ICU, and make sure that we're protecting them very, very cautiously. So if you are taking care of a loved one um, who really does need help, making sure they're staying at home, maybe uh, run and do a grocery run for them or get supplies for them so they're not out and about and protected at this time. So two questions from two different people that uh, relate to, uh, to a certain extent in terms of uh, businesses that we've not uh, asked to close. Uh, the first from, from Britt R. 
is will you be asking all salons to close? Social distancing is not possible in this industry. It's true that in that case, uh, social distancing is, is not possible in that direct contact, but there, there usually aren't large crowds of people there and bringing that. So uh, we would be recommending that folks that are involved in that kind of engagement, though, are properly you know, sanitizing their hands and wiping down surfaces and that type of thing. But it's also something that you might want to think about, avoiding not something we're not closing now. Second question, will we be closing liquor stores? Again, uh, there's no reason that, that right at the moment to, to close liquor stores. You don't have the congregation of uh, that many people at one time, although I was in the liquor store the other day and there were a lot of people in there, so something probably we'll have to keep our eye on. So the question I have is why would you close schools but not daycares if children are less likely to contract the virus? It, it is true what we're seeing is that those who are in younger age categories are less likely to get sick from the virus and may even be less likely to tr transmit the virus. We're watching the CDC, the Center for Disease Control's guidance very closely on this issue and right now they are guiding uh, areas and localities that have uh, less community spread, minimal to no community spread where we can actually trace where the positive exposure was to coronavirus to maintain business as usual as much as possible. And that means the guidance says leave, have schools stay open, have daycares stay open. They are a critical part. But what we did hear very loudly from the schools, and Governor, you responded to, is that we really, uh, not based on public health reasons, but needed more time to plan for educational opportunities and thinking about meal delivery and other services that are provided to families during that time. Um, at this point, daycares are, are in that same category. We know we're not quite at community spread, and we know daycares are really important to keep people in their jobs, um, con currently working, have support so that our healthcare communities and providers can go to work and provide essential healthcare uh, supports as well. And so we're trying to balance those needs of continuing to watch for public health uh, uh, threats and emerging um, disease prevalence in the community, but also making sure that our employees can go to work. Yeah, and that's one of the harder questions, frankly, because of the employees and the essential nature of those daycare facilities today with folks working obviously uh, we're encouraging folks to work from home but if you look at the decisions made by other governors and we've talked about this you know the governors in our surrounding states have closed the schools but kept daycares open and actually were because of the controlled environments there there can be some benefit to to that as well now here's uh, we have three questions uh, th here uh, around the school closing uh, issue and the first question is uh, I would just I'd like to mention that the, uh, when we decided to uh, close the schools last week uh, uh, for two weeks uh, with the idea of helping them plan for educating the, the children long into the future if that might be necessary we established a, a working group of chiefs uh, with uh, Secretary Bunting to start to uh, think about all the issues that are uh, implicated when you close the schools as we ha have and we've we've got some of those questions here Lucy from uh, Fenwick Island asked will the CDC recommendations to shut down schools for eight weeks happen in Delaware and again this is we've we've uh, d uh, directed them to close for two weeks and it is possible that could be extended depending on uh, the circumstances on the ground here in our state as we get uh, through the, the first two weeks that, that are currently uh, under the order. And uh, exactly why we've put this working group together to figure out how do we educate children remotely or provide a, an educational experience uh, for these children for a longer shutdown, if you will, uh, an eight-week we eight week shutdown. We can't just not educate uh, children for eight weeks with having a real detrimental effect on those children you only go to third or fourth grade fifth grade twelfth grade whatever it is once and you can't lose that much uh, material so we've got a working group focused on that how can we educate children effectively remotely who are the individuals that might fall through that cracks how can we find uh, creative workarounds if we're uh, if we are forced to stay uh, closed down for more than two weeks so we're really going to look take these two weeks to 
to uh, lean into that question and figure out uh, the answer going forward. So the, the next question about schools is a follow-up to that, and it's what, will our kids be required to go to summer school? Now, I, I, I basically can only say it's possible. Um, we're going to try to figure out as we get through this how many days uh, are missed. We've already uh, have an agreement with the the the. Uh, school superintendents to go to their boards and ask them to take some of the days from their uh, otherwise scheduled spring uh, vacation in exchange for the days uh, that are being missed over the next two weeks. I know one school district, Indian River, has already uh, uh, made that proposal to the board. Nobody's acted on it yet, but uh, I know that we didn't have any snow days this year, so districts have uh, s saved up some snow days there. So we're going to try every, every possible way to make sure this critical function, the education of our children, uh, can occur while the children aren't in school and while we're protecting them and, and most importantly, their grandmoms and grandpops uh, uh, from this coronavirus. So thank you all the questions. Stay tuned in. We'll continue to provide updates uh, on the school closure sit situation and, and importantly on how are we going to feed children that, that get fed at school? And we're, I think we've figured some, uh, we have some ideas for that. And how are we going to educate the children uh, if they're not physically in the school buildings? So the next question is about, will Delaware grocery stores do senior hours for older residents to shop without huge crowds? Uh, we certainly think this is a, a great idea and suggestion and hope that there are some grocery store managers maybe listening who could operationalize that and think about how to support older residents. I think there are also many in the community, many nonprofits who are collectively coming together to brainstorm other kinds of creative ideas to make sure that we're addressing the needs of our most vulnerable community residents right now. Um, I just met today with, with a large group of Delaware nonprofits who are brainstorming and asking what are the additional community supports and services needed? How do we make sure that seniors have meals delivered? Um, do we need to start thinking about grocery services? Can we think about how to make sure that other supports are in place for people who are out of work for an extended period of time? So really looking forward to what that collective um, uh, energy is going to bring to the table, but I think this is a great idea. It wouldn't be something we would mandate, right, Governor? But I think it is something that uh, many out in the community are already thinking of and picking up ideas and just running with it. Yeah, so I've got some questions that relate to that. So uh, assistance for individuals now who might find themselves to be out of work, they're not getting a paycheck. I mentioned that we're, we've got in our uh, executive order, a, uh, some waivers for the Department of Labor and the charge to the Department of Labor to look at unemployment uh, payments and insurance for, for those folks so that we can make sure that folks to the extent possible are, are made whole. And so some of the, we've already made some progress on evictions uh, as a result or, or turn off of utility services already, Delmarva and Chesapeake Utilities have said that they won't cut folks off if they're not able to pay their utilities. The city of Wilmington, I know, is, uh, is doing a similar thing, stopping those shutoffs. That's a very, uh, very good thing. You know, obviously, the most important thing is to try to limit the amount of lost income that individuals have. And so that's where unemployment insurance uh, might come in. And we're looking at ways to, to, to make that work. Uh, so here's another question, and is there anything in place for those who can't pay their mortgage or rent during this period? Uh, again, I mentioned unemployment. The, the key element here is making sure that there are resources available for folks that, that aren't able to go to work and get a paycheck, and unemployment is, is an important part of that. We also do have uh, supports for uh, folks that are falling behind in, in their mortgages. This was very uh, relevant uh, over 12 years ago, uh, back in 2007, 2008, when the, we had the mortgage crisis here in our state, and we have a program called DMAP uh, that uh, provides uh, resources and support for folks that find themselves uh, behind in their mortgage payments. We're also working with the courts uh, for that, so that uh, people who who uh, can't pay their mortgage or their rent are not, uh, are not evicted in the case of the rent. And then the question from Bertha, uh, will there be any financial relief for small businesses? 
it's one of the things that we're learning is <clears throat> the uh, federal government passed legislation uh, to help uh, here in this crisis. And it's my understanding we're still learning more uh, about the de details there, but uh, that there are loans available through the Small Business uh, Administration and others to help small business owners through, through this period. So just some questions in terms of financial support for individuals who find themselves uh, not getting a paycheck and obviously small businesses whose businesses are going to be hurt uh, with the whole uh, uh, situation. So there's a question from Carol O. Oh, what are the plans for adult day programs for those with intellectual disabilities? Uh, this is a really important part of how we're taking care of our most vulnerable, and we certainly don't have plans at this point to um, limit or, or make any changes to those critical programs that provide a safety net. Uh, we do uh, want to hear from individuals who have suggestions, <coughs> and one uh, that I heard today talking to Easter Seals is that we really want to make sure um, that people know that they are open. They may change some events or programming to make sure that people do have a space and social distancing between them and that we're training our um, workers to make sure that they know how they can protect themselves, that if they're sick, they should stay home, um, and certainly uh, washing hands and avoiding touching your face. All of those personal protections are critically important right now. Uh, we do know, again, that the virus is transmitted through cough, but it, it is certainly something that is more serious for those who have other mm -hmm. chronic underlying medical conditions. So we've been talking about about uh, ways to, again, reduce the size and exposure. And I think those are all relevant, um, but obviously some services have to continue. Yeah, and I think it's really important, a really important message in, in all of this is that the most vulnerable are the elderly and people with compromised uh, health situations and, and compromised uh, immune systems. And so, it, you know, we all need to think about uh, our elderly uh, parents and grandparents and friends that we know to make sure that they're they're kind of self-isolating and that uh, they're not uh, exposing themselves in the public, that their uh, folks that are in nursing homes are adequately being taken care of. Just attend to that. Perfect example, my mother, who's going to be 89 years old uh, next week, my, my brother had, has had the flu, and he'd call me a couple times about getting tested. Turns out he doesn't really fit the profile. He's younger, he's relatively healthy. Uh, he didn't have, he had the fever, but not all the symptoms. And so he was self-isolating, except for my mom wanted to go over there and uh, take her chicken soup for him as, you know, having a conversation with your mom about not going to see your, her son with her chicken soup when he's sick is a hard conversation to have, but she was, uh, we were able to get her to, to take the chicken soup over it and leave it out on his uh, front step. But it's those kinds of things. Uh, my mom was also uh, planning to fly to California to visit my sister, and we decided that that was probably not a good idea at this time. So plug in, think about uh, your moms and, and dads, your grandmoms and granddads, those that are in that elderly category to make sure they're taking care of themselves and, and we can all help out. I think so, we all need her recipe for chicken soup. Yeah, it's Post a good one, later. Uh, for sure. So I have a, a, a several questions that go to testing and and uh, preventing the spread of uh, of the virus to people who are not symptomatic. Uh, and this is from Christina K. Uh, let me let me start with the uh, the testing question. The specific question from Pat in Sussex County is when will we have a, 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 a testing station in Sussex County? Well, last week, at the end of the last week, we had a conference call with the hospitals and each of them, including BB and Nanticoke in Sussex County, are thinking about ways that they can uh, do drive uh, through testing arrangements or, or testing sites outside of the hospital. What we don't want to do is have testing sites in the emergency room or in the hospital. And so now that there are more test kits available uh, this week and more uh, in the days and, and weeks ahead, we need to think about a way that we can systematically uh, make te uh, have tests available for individuals who are symptomatic uh, and present either in a drive-through basis or specific locations in each of the three counties. And something that uh, Dr. Rattay and I talked about today 
and uh, something that her people are thinking through and just uh, trying to figure out the logistics of that, working in conjunction with the hospitals and their efforts to stand up these drive-through operations. So I would expect uh, and hope in the, sh in the near term we'll have uh, a plan to do that kind of testing. Governor, I'm going to tag on because Nancy J asked, will there be a schedule posted in advance of drive-through testing? So this is related where we've had two of our hospital partners uh, stand up the drive-through mobile uh, testing sites. And certainly they posted it. It was a first dry run. I think we learned a lot about how to make sure we're coordinating between the state to track people who may be high at risk and make sure that we're coordinating on those results. They have a different kind of uh, send out period and, and return for those results. And so we want to really identify those who are highest risk uh, to make sure we're running those tests right. quickly. Uh, but certainly uh, in terms of getting more tests out there, we need that partnership with the hospitals. And so yep. hopefully we'll be able to coordinate in the coming days and weeks to make sure there's uh, opportunities throughout the state, north to south, but also that we're posting in advance so people know about them. And it's, I think it's really uh, important that we get a testing site in each county with some uh, a regular schedule or publicity around it so folks know where to go. Uh, there's a greater level of comfort around there and better uh, coordination. I, I really think we'll get good information uh, back from the testing that Christiana Care did at their drive-through and really have an indication of, you know, because they did uh, uh, between 500 and 600 tests and that'll give us some idea of, uh, of what we're looking at out there in, in the community. Um, so one of the questions related to that, so all the things that we're talking about, particularly limiting crowds, uh, the advice on appropriate hygiene, don't cough into the air, you know, cough into your, your arm, uh, make sure you're washing your hands, wiping down surfaces that are touched a lot, social distancing, all of those to Christina Kay are directed towards uh, preventing the spread of the virus to those folks who are, who are not uh, symptomatic. And then the testing is to give us an idea of the spread that's out there and the risk associated with uh, with community spread. And we'll be making different decisions based on that. And as I said, the data point that we'll get with the, uh, the information from the Christiana Care a test will be instructive for all our decisions going forward. Question I, here. Governor, if I sure, could just add, please. you know, if you are thinking I have some of these symptoms that people are talking about, maybe a, a high fever, a cough, congestion, you think maybe you've been exposed, we do definitely want you to call the DPH right. uh, hotline because we have the state lab ready to make sure that they're um, testing individuals who are high risk. And again, that number is 1-866-408-1899. Uh, Those test results typically come back within an uh, eight to 12 hour period, depending on when we take the test. And we want you to know that we are here to help and talk to you about whether you are high risk and, and need to be tested immediately. So this is a, another question that, that's uh, difficult to answer at, at this point in time with this evolving situation. Uh, but it, the question is, is it possible that this will become a statewide quarantine? Do we have the resources to handle that? And you know, one of the uh, you know, one of the big questions uh, that we're asking is not so much do we have the resources to handle a statewide quarantine. I'm not sure I, I understand exactly what that means, but the focus is on making sure that we have the surge capacity resources for people that need hospitalization. And that's a conversation that we're having with our emergency management team headed up by A.J. Shaw. We've got the National Guard resources. That's the kind of thing that they do in terms of standing up an operation like that is certainly something that we're thinking about uh, as we look at the experience in other states. Again, on our conference call this afternoon uh, with the Vice President, uh, Governor Jay Inslee for Washington uh, spoke up and talked about the challenges that he's facing in his state with respect to hospital resources, surge capacity, ICU units, and those are things that we're thinking about as well. It's not directly to your question, uh, but it is, you know, the concern that we have going forward if this uh, continues to, to spread. And I think the idea behind some of the measures in the 
a state of emergency is that we would avoid a place where we'd get to a full on quarantine like other countries have had to implement uh, because they weren't able to uh, get it get ahead of the disease spread and it was so widespread that they just told people our health care system is overwhelmed we need people to stay in place and almost put court orders and other um, kind of enforcement measures in place we, we hope that through dis social distancing practices and other ways that we're really limiting person to person contact we can avoid some of those more drastic measures but right. certainly we'll continue to watch and and see uh, we really need everyone's cooperation in making sure that the measures that are in place are are are, are followed the the question i have is why did the dph website remove tallies for pending and negative tests and people being monitored um, this is a, a moving target to track not only the people who are testing positive but at some point monitoring the difference between people being monitored at home who are maybe exposed or um, or self-monitoring versus exposed and kind of self-quarantining are right. different and so we have decided to really focus our attention on making sure we have accurate up-to-date information on the number of positive cases that number around negative tests and uh, people being monitored is is quickly blurring as we've just right. heard Christiana did 500 to 600 tests um, at some point, it's really hard to know the difference between giving someone advice about staying at home and checking their symptoms and, and knowing you have a negative test. Um, we do want to get helpful information out there, but really want to make sure we're putting information out that's accurate and up to date. Yeah, isn't it fair to say that the real thing that we're um, anticipating and, and looking for is this idea of community spread? In other words, uh, somebody who has a positive uh, test where we can't identify the source of of, uh, of that uh, transfer. And uh, right now, most of these cases, at least six of the eight, have been that small group of university bioscience folks that traveled out of state or folks that they connected to. And so once you start getting beyond those known uh, parameters, it gets to be a little bit a different game. Is that absolutely, accurate? Absolutely, yeah. absolutely. I think it's much harder to track um, who's asymptomatic and just home or or who really has had that positive exposure. And, and what is really important right now is limiting the course of disease. Once you get beyond being able to trace the individual context to a positive known case, it becomes much harder and the measures are different. The action steps are different. That's when you start to hear about um, measures that do limit even further um, uh, limits on the number of people and large gatherings. Again, you see this push from uh, the president today to move to si 10 as the size limit right. because we are seeing in our nation this spread right. that's gone beyond being able to track it. And so we want people to be aware and, and be even more cautious in their everyday interactions. And that's rel uh, relevant to this uh, next uh, question from Danny uh, in Dover which is what is our guidance for the church officials for services this Sunday and in future weeks? Uh, well, we know we, we addressed this at our, our uh, virtual town hall meeting last week, and I indicated that uh, my church, so the advice from the bishop was that we would still have Sunday mass, but there wouldn't be the, the kiss of peace, and there wouldn't be uh, communion through a, a certain uh, you know chalice. Uh, now, with the new guidelines ratcheting it down to gatherings of 10, uh, the guidance would be to not to have services unless there were fewer than that. And as it turns out, when I was in church uh, yesterday, uh, the bishop's uh, uh, message was, uh, was read, and he's closing uh, the churches for church services uh, uh, for the time being. And so for other uh, denominations, the advice would be the same. Uh, in terms of gatherings of uh, f uh, ten people or more, and so we're we're at that uh, we're at that place. So Brian Z asked, is someone who visited buildings at the University of Delaware recently recommended or required to self quarantine? Uh, so it is. This is an, another important uh, issue around how long does the virus stay around 
after potential exposure. Uh, and we really don't know exactly, but we think it lasts on surfaces for about 24 hours. Um, now, if you're doing general cleaning with any typical disinfectant, uh, the virus is pretty easily uh, killed. And so if you were in the building and there was recent cleaning, certainly it's very low risk and shouldn't have any worry about um, requiring yourself to self-quarantine. The, the difference is if you were uh, potentially among the group of identified cases from the University of Delaware community and we've reached out to you or one of your um, colleagues who may say, hey, I have coronavirus, uh, reaches out to you, we would want to know and definitely recommend that you um, stay at home, you monitor your temperature with the thermometer twice a day, you check for symptoms, and you do that for 14 days and really stay away from people. But just visiting a building or another location is not uh, put you in a higher level of risk for getting the coronavirus. So the next question is, uh, are we looking at the federal government uh, to lead in this response or are we taking our own steps. I think it's a, it's a partnership. We're certainly looking to the science uh, that we've uh, received and the information and guidance that we received from the Centers for Disease Control uh, and uh, Department of Health and Social Services at the, at the federal level. Uh, I participate uh, in our periodic uh, conference calls with uh, Vice President Pence, who's leading up the task force at the federal level, we hear and listen to uh, what other states are doing. I think it's fair to say that really the governors uh, are leading the effort on the ground in their individual states. And every state is a little bit different. Uh, you know, like I, I keep referring to uh, the state of Washington, which really probably has the, the worst situation. Uh, state of New York, again, similar. Uh, bad situation and uh, looking at the uh, actions taken by governors in, in those states, looking to uh, what happens in those states if you don't do this or don't do that. And so it's a combination of uh, getting information and resources mostly from the federal level. Uh, they have the national stockpiles and in, in equipment, uh, testing equipment and, and the like. Uh, they've just passed, the Congress has just passed uh, legislation to make financial um, resources available. And I understand that Delaware will be getting uh, four or five million dollars there, which will help in our activities. But uh, we're basically, with our uh, team uh, headed by A.J. Shaw at the uh, Department of Emergency Management, the, the uh, Emergency Management Agency, and the uh, Dr. Rattay, Division of Public Health, Dr. Walker, uh, we're making decisions here on the ground uh, based on science and based on uh, the situation here in, uh, in Delaware with the cases that we have. And, and it'll continue to change. It's, a, it's an evolving situation and a day-to-day -day proposition. So uh, someone asked, will the closing of restaurants and bar, how will the closing of restaurants and bars be enforced? And that's something that we're going to continue to monitor. Uh, we certainly have put out guidance around making sure that takeout options are still available and delivery, uh, but it is something we're closely working with our uh, mayors and county officials on making sure that enforcement is in place. I uh, it'll I talk, be evolving, right? Yeah, I talked to Mayor Przicki uh, uh, in Wilmington, Mayor Clifton in Newark today, and they have resources to do that. We also have our ABC enforcement officials. So it would be, again, uh, a law enforcement approach to that. Uh, both mayors uh, have uh, agencies that are familiar with, uh, with those kinds of activities, that, with gather gatherings that get out of control or that are not uh, consistent with uh, the current law and regulation. And so uh, that's how those will be enforced. Now, this is an interesting question from Ellen S which is, will the tax deadline be extended? Well, uh, there's been some rumor that the uh, tax filing deadline at the federal level, April 15th, will be extended. We haven't heard that from the IRS or from uh, the vice president's task force. But if they do extend uh, their uh, filing deadline of uh, April 15th, since we piggyback, state uh, income tax piggybacks on the federal return, 
we will have to uh, extend ours as well. So uh, we'll we'll take that as it comes and 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 uh, depend on what uh, what happens at the federal level. If we get to a point uh, where we need to consider that independently, we'll do that uh, as well. Debbie M has a question about uh, recommendations for canceling or changing summer travel plans. Uh, this is a tough one. I would say that at this point, it's difficult to say what will happen this summer. Uh, the optimist in me wants to think that at, by the time we get to summer, we'll be at a new normal where uh, we'll have a better sense of the capacity of our healthcare system and whether these limits will still be in place on travel and events and other places that we commonly go in the summer. But it's really hard to know. Um, we certainly are all experiencing the, a chance to enjoy the outdoors a little bit more with fewer places to go. Uh, and it's certainly something that it may be uh, that we are feeling the consequences of the coronavirus spread for a long time. Um, it, I've seen models, I don't know, maybe you've seen these graphs too that say that if we have measures in place now that delay the spread and the peak of coronavirus through the community that we may see it um, push into the summer months and it'll be a, a lower burden on the community. Fewer people will get it, but it will still kind of linger almost into the fall. And so it'll be hard to, to know for sure. Um, you know, some say it, we'd rather be at a place where we're overdoing it and, and overestimating what may happen. And so we're trying to put precautions in place and hopefully we'll be better prepared if things change as they come. Yeah, and back to the, back to the question about uh, federal guidance and, and state action. I mean, we are, uh, the information that's now coming out today uh, from CDC uh, and from the, the team in Washington is the need to really flatten that curve at the beginning to kind of reduce in every way we can uh, the number of, uh, of new cases because once it gets to a, a point, it's just so much more difficult uh, to stop and to get under control. And that's, a, I think, an approach that certainly makes uh, sense. Uh, approaching it with an abundance of caution. We are, we have taken dramatic actions today in limiting uh, opportunities for social context, closing bars, closing restaurants, except for takeout service. And by the way, I would encourage all Delawareans to, to go to your favorite uh, restaurant and get uh, order some takeout food so that they can get some income during this uh, period of time. It's something that we all need to, to pull together around. But the, I think the key is now is to take this opportunity with the number of cases that we have confirmed positives and the ones that we were likely to see over the next couple days as the Christiana Care testing uh, comes back and additional testing that we're doing. And we're, there's going to be more and more testing. And with that testing, we're going to uh, no doubt uh, see more and more uh, positive cases. And so if we can really pull together now, be vigilant to, on the appropriate hygiene practices, really think about social distancing, take care of our elderly parents, uh, grandparents, uh, and friends, you know, we're all going to be better off and we'll be able to protect the health and safety of, of all Delawareans. I, you took a moment to, to say all that because I don't have yeah, any questions, questions here. So, oh, well, then you, you want to share some for me? One. Okay. So, uh, so while you think about that new question, I have two questions that are related. One from Courtney and one from Bert about um, nursing home employees and group homes. And I think these, again, are special populations that we really need to think about carefully. And we are developing guidance and technical resources to those who are working in nursing home communities or group home settings, uh, because we don't want to uh, restrict uh, the access, but we certainly recognize that visitors present uh, potentially a lot of harm to these individuals who are most likely um, to, to have a lot of uh, <coughs> ill consequences if they were to get coronavirus in the facility. Uh, so we are providing specific guidance about uh, those particular facilities. We are, we are not suggesting that um, there's any type of lockdown at this point, but we certainly are saying, look at your visitor policy based on the Center for Medicare and Medicaid Services guidance, which says that visit, visitation really should be limited except in particular uh, situations, uh, that we should provide access for visitation through telephone and video uh, while there is the potential for um, 
a, a grave impact from coronavirus, and we should make sure that we're using really uh, important precautions around if employees are sick, they should stay home, right. and again, all the things that we've been talking about, but um, really important to make sure that we're following those and keeping people safe. I think that that is uh, critical, particularly for our vulnerable populations. So the question from Tammy is, will movie theaters be closing? What if it's a large theater with over 50 seats? Well, uh, as I said at the outset, uh, our current uh, declaration, our current advice and guidance that went out today and was revised from uh, the state of emergency that uh, we proclaimed last week, uh, put that target at 50. The CDC, uh, President Trump has ratcheted that down to 10. Uh, and so movie theaters closing will be something that we'll be looking at uh, for the next declaration as we as we ratchet it down from 50 to 50 to 10 based on the the latest uh, cdc in all of these uh, uh, declarations and, and and all of this advice uh, the idea of social distancing is an important part of what we're trying to achieve and so if there are situations where that distancing can be achieved then you know we want to uh, you know, allow some people, folks to, to stay operating. Now, again, it, this could change uh, tomorrow. Uh, could change at any minute based on uh, this, uh, changing circumstances in terms of positive uh, test results that are coming back. Uh, and, uh, and that's why we're, uh, we're taking it uh, one day at a time. Yeah, the Center for Disease Control has given us pretty clear guidance and protocols around what we need to monitor in our community around whether there's no spread, um, just some known positive cases, minimal to moderate spread, and then uh, more extensive spread that we're continuing to see those decision points differ, but uh, something that we have to use our own best data. And th that's actually this question from Mandy M. How will you handle people who don't follow quarantine protocol and put others at risk? Um, you know, this far in our process of investigation of all of the eight cases, everyone has been completely uh, willing to cooperate with the self quarantine process and something that they really take seriously and have stayed home and monitored their symptoms, reported them in. Um, <coughs> and stayed put and haven't been out and about um, really trying to uh, cause harm to their neighbors and, and loved ones. And I think that's where we continue to see the, the important process evolve of contact investigation. But once it gets harder to know right. if you've been exposed, it's even harder to know if you're right. self-quarantining and staying home or monitoring or what these different levels even mean. And, and that's why we continue to make sure that we're monitoring, I think, at some point all of us uh, will be at risk at some point to get the coronavirus. It might not be today, it might not be next week, but it might be next fall. And we just don't know how much of this will kind of circulate. Like every, every year we see a different version of the flu. We certainly have seen uh, similar kinds of uh, evolution of this uh, widespread community um, coronavirus. And it, uh, and it, is, our, the, it is the case, uh, is it not? I mean, you monitor it, as you, as you say, uh, converse, have conversations back and forth with those who've pest, tested positive that uh, none of those individuals have a serious illness. That, that, that's right. still the case, that's right? right. Yeah. yeah, they're all home, uh, not in the hospital, and right. I think that's really important. And, you know, it is one of the things that you see in the media that right. makes people uh, nervous. And I, actually, this is my next one. You do, you're not getting any new questions. I don't know about this. But uh, please explain the difference of mortality rate on those over age 60 years of uh, over age 60 versus under. And, and what I think we, they probably just didn't want me to try to answer that may, question. Maybe, maybe. They needed, um, they needed a medical doctor to Well, to and I need my PowerPoint. So I think this is the challenge right now is that we're really um, seeing a difference in age category of those who are um, dying from this disease. And it is related to uh, respiratory failure um, and heart failure. There's something about the virus that attaches to the heart and makes it harder to breathe and that's where the shortness of breath comes from and uh, people have their lungs fill up with fluid and, and uh, really suffer. Uh, but somehow it spikes right after age 60. Um, the 70 to 80 year olds are having a, a more difficulty and then the over 80 year old uh, population is having even more difficulty. And that's why, again, if we can keep our uh, elderly safe 
um, away from those who may have been exposed, uh, we will have a better chance of addressing uh, what could come. And what we're seeing in other countries is that um, the pressures among the older people who are getting this are really creating difficulties with making sure we have adequate ICU beds and hospital beds to take care of all the people who need it. So we want to keep those people safe who are most at risk. And is it not the case as well that the very young, it seems like the the infection rate is is, is surprisingly low. Is yeah, under age uh, 19 <coughs> and even lower, we haven't seen very much in those who are under age nine. And so we're really monitoring that. And we don't know if young people just aren't actually getting the virus. They have strong immune systems, strong respiratory systems. They're used to getting colds and the sniffles and fight it off faster than uh, the others or whether there's something else about the virus that isn't impacting them. We're, we really don't know yet. Right. So uh, we've got one last question, uh, and then I'm going to reread the, uh, the hotline number uh, and the website. Uh, this question is from Faith M. And it's a, a great question, and right in line with what we're thinking, could you consider waiving park fees? Actually, we are considering waiving park fees. And in fact, park, the parks are free now because it's winter time. We don't collect fees in the winter. Uh, they will start collecting them soon. I'm not exactly sure of the date, but I've asked Secretary Garvin to consider waiving fees just because it's a really good opportunity uh, uh, and an activity for folks, uh, students, kids that are home from school, parents to go out and get a walk in the White Clay Creek. Uh, I got a, a text from one of our legislators the other day he was taking a walk uh, along the White Clay Creek and, and outside of Newark. It was a beautiful day. And uh, he was saying what a wonderful experience it was. And we ought to be encouraging all Delawareans to take advantage of our, our parks and other venues during this time when uh, children aren't in school and they're looking for things to do. And I think that's a good way to kind of wrap it up is to uh, it's been a, a good uh, opportunity for Dr. Walker and I to answer all the questions that we could tonight, very real, practical questions uh, relevant to the situation uh, that we have here with so many uh, businesses and uh, closed in our state and the message that we're, we're getting out to make sure that everybody uh, is taking care of themselves, taking care of their elderly relatives, practicing appropriate social distancing, washing your hands, not touching uh, your face, uh, coughing uh, into your arm, not into the air, doing all those protective measures. If you're sick, not going to work, we're encouraging obviously as many people as possible and making those opportunities to work remotely for, for state employees. Uh, we're trying to deliver state services uh, over the internet so we don't have that one-on-one uh, -on -one, uh, public safety, safety s s public facing uh, touch there and so if we if we pull together and work uh, together uh, we're going to come out of this all right so again the uh, hotline number at the division of public health is 1-866-408-1899 the website is de.gov slash coronavirus. Uh, and again, the uh, website for uh, motor vehicle is mydmv, mydmv.delaware.gov. Thank you again for tuning uh, in tonight. Uh, make sure you're practicing appropriate hygiene and be safe. Thanks very much.